All right, uh, let's get started. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here at tonight's event, uh, sponsored by the Center um, for Politics and the People. I'm Henrik Schatzinger, uh, Interim Director of the Center and uh, Professor of Political Science. What makes these events special is your attendance and participation. So again, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, to those of you who are with us in person, as well as those of you who will be watching this discussion online. Uh, our panel discussion tonight will analyze uh, the state and national election results and explore the outlook for the next year. I'm excited that we have three dis distinguished panelists uh, to discuss questions surrounding the election tonight. Let me introduce them to you. On the screen, we have Emily Fannin, who is uh, joining us via Zoom. She is a politics and state government reporter at CBS 58 Milwaukee. Fennin joined CBS 58 after serving as the Capitol Bureau Chief for WKOW in Madison, Wisconsin for three years. During her time in Madison, she covered the 2020 presidential election and interviewed major party candidates, including Vice Presidents uh, <coughs> Mike Pence, then Vice President Joe Biden, and other prominent figures tied to the Trump and Biden campaigns. She received her master's degree in uh, political affairs reporting and began her career as a state house reporter at the Illinois State Capitol. Her coverage included the rise and fall of the longest budget impasse in modern day history, as well as the historic school funding reform. Next, we have Jesse Opoyan, uh, who is the Capitol Bureau Chief at the Capitol Times in Madison. Uh, Opoyan joined the Capitol Times in 2013, primarily covering government and politics. She served as opinion editor from 2019 to 2021, and then returned to political reporting. She previously wrote for the newspapers in Ames, Iowa, and Oshkosh, Wisconsin as a general assignment reporter, often covering county, state, and national politics. And uh, lastly, we have, um, we welcome Charlie Sykes back on campus. Uh, um, Charlie Sykes has been with us uh, every, every couple of years, I want to say, and we're always happy to have him back. Uh, Sykes is the founder and editor at large of The Bulwark, host of The Bulwark podcast, and an NBC, MSNBC contributor. Until he stepped down in December 2016, after 23 years, Sykes was one of the Wisconsin's top-rated and most influential conservative uh, talk show hosts. He is the author of nine books, including How the Right Lost Its Mind, which was first released in 2017 and updated in 2018. Sykes has written for many newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington, well, actually, it's bad. The Washington Post, Time.com, and many other national publications. He has appeared on Meet the Press, State of the Union, with Jack Tapper, the, the Today Show, ABC, NBC, Fox News, CNN, and other TV stations. He's also the former contributing editor to the Weekly Standard, and he has served as editor of Milwaukee Magazine, editor of Wisconsin Interest Magazine, and founder and editor-in-chief of Right Wisconsin. Sykes serves as the president of Defending Democracy Together Institute, sits on the advisory board of the Democracy Fund, and is a member of the board of Stand Up Republic. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So our, our plan for tonight is as follows. I will begin uh, with uh, engaging the panelists in a series of questions, and after roughly 30 minutes or so, we will open up the conversation uh, to you, the audience. So, um, let's start. Um, a few days ago, New York Times uh, columnist uh, David Brooks uh, cited someone in a conversation who summarized the midterm election the following way. Voters don't like the Democrats, but they rather vote for a party that's out of touch with the American people than for a party that has lost its mind. Do you agree with this, or why do you think the red wave didn't reach the shore, perhaps uh, with the exception of Florida? Um, let's see if uh, our Zoom uh, function works here. Emily, do you want to take on this question? Sure. Um 
Why Republicans didn't get a red wave? Well, I would say there are multiple factors. Um, the day after the election, as many of us reporters uh, got a few hours of sleep, uh, the conversations I had with Republicans were, uh, a lot of it, uh, there was this Trump aura um, around some of the candidates, specifically here in Wisconsin. Uh, Tim Michaels, uh, of course, kind of, it, Trump's endorsement helped him during the August primary to beat Rebecca Clayfish, but his campaign tried to keep Trump at a distance afterwards. But a lot of my sources were telling me that that, that Trump aura was still there, and specifically here in Wisconsin, you know, in the wild counties, the suburban moms were a little bit turned off by that, and specifically Tim Michaels underperformed in that area. Also fundraising, Trump wasn't giving a lot of his candidates a lot of money. Um, when it comes to the governor's race, Governor Tony Evers outspent Tim Michaels, I believe it was close to somewhere three to one, so he had a lot of money on his side, and I think it was a true factor of just how negative, negative advertising can work um, in a lot of races across the country, and I think it just turned off a lot of voters and you know campaigns that have money are able to use attack ads to their advantage um, and also I think just quality of the candidates is something that I consistently heard across the board not just here in Wisconsin um, but across the nation. Since you mentioned money and money is sort of my specialization of research uh, I hope you don't mind if I just follow up with you right away. Um, Let's just take a look at the U.S. Senate race here in, in Wisconsin. One thing that stood out to me is the ability, or was the ability of Senator Johnson to raise um, a lot more money from, through these outside groups, about 30 million or so more than I saw for Nella Barnes. Uh, so in a state like Wisconsin, do you think that this can make a difference? Money definitely makes a difference. And with that specific U.S. Senate race, um, one thing is that Mandela Barnes wasn't able to define himself. The Johnson campaign shortly after the primary did it before he had a chance to get on air and really talk about what he was about. Um, so that, I think, really hurt the Barnes campaign early on. And Ron Johnson, of course, had much more money in the long run uh, compared to Barnes. So Barnes had some spurts here and there. His campaign, I believe, about a month and a half before the general election, he reported about $20 million, um, but it still just wasn't enough. Mm. Yeah, thank you for your insights, uh, Emily. I want to come back to the red red wave question and why it didn't materialize, and maybe, uh, maybe Charlie, you have some thoughts on this. Well, I think it comes down to several factors. I mean, number one, um, Dobbs. Number two, uh, election denialism. Three, extremism. Number four would be Donald Trump. Um, clearly, uh, the uh, you know if, if Democrats wanted to send a fruit basket to anybody, they probably should send it to Sam Alito because I think that that changed the electorate, it changed the the focus, um, and I think there was no way that the, the uh, Republicans were going to be able to counter the mobilization that you saw among women, particularly, and among young people. Uh, election denialism turned out to be an absolute political loser. Uh, all of the um, you know, stop the steal candidates and races for governor and secretary of state were uh, to a person defeated, an absolute clean uh, sweep, uh, which obviously should send a signal to Republicans about uh, 2024. Um, extremism, um, this is, goes to the point that David Brooks was talking about, that I think voters were a little bit tired, disillusioned maybe with the Democrats, but they were scared of the Republicans. And I think that there was a a sense in the final weeks of that campaign that, that there would be no consequences for any of the crazy things they said. After Paul Pelosi was attacked with a hammer, Carrie Lake goes out and jokes about it. Um, she gives a speech where he said, she says, in Arizona, are there any McCain Republicans here because we don't want you. Uh, you had uh, the former president tweeting out anti-Semitic memes and calling Mitch McConnell's wife Coco Chow, and no Republican said anything about it because they thought they were going to win, that the wind was at their back, that they would never be held accountable for these bizarre and extreme positions, and in fact, uh, they, they were. And finally, as everybody's gonna comment, uh, Donald Trump was on the ballot. And this is what makes this different than most midterm elections because usually it is a referendum on the party in power, but this time, it also became then the choice between this other party that was out of power but 
making significant changes on issues like a woman's right to choose, and also Donald Trump standing in the uh, in the uh, in, in the wings. And look, you know, when it comes to in Wisconsin, I hope we can talk about Wisconsin because I have a lot of thoughts about those races. Um, in Wisconsin, the big question is who is going to turn out the base in these huge numbers? And Jesse can address this. But Donald Trump was the, is the ultimate turnout mechanism for Democrats. <laughs> Look, I, I'm sure that it's mainly Jesse's persuasiveness, but Dane County, I just want to highlight one thing. Dane County is this massive engine for Democratic votes. Tony Evers' margin in Dane County was greater than the entire vote from 2002 in the election for governor. That's how much Dane County has grown. That's how intense it has become. And I think that, that was, that's a real indication of the power of, uh, of, of the Dobbs decision, uh, overturning Roe versus Wade, and of uh, Trump being on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in addition, of course, we can also mention that uh, just one third of population growth in Wisconsin alone is centered just in Dane County. That's, uh, that's, that's how important uh, that county is. Uh, now, it's kind of a nice maybe you know transition. You know, going back to the sort of red wave question, I don't know if you agree or disagree with some of the things you've heard. Any things that you want to add to that, and then maybe you can also, if you want to come back to the issue of like you know Dane County and turnout, maybe you can address it as well. Sure. I mean, I agree with everything that everyone said. I don't think you can overstate the importance of Dobbs. Um, it was huge in driving out young voters. Um, the Evers campaign spent a lot of time on college campuses and found that this was resonating and. Um, you know, you, every election, everyone says it's going to come down to young voters, and then people are let down. And this year, they weren't. They they came through. Um, I think also, you know, you, yeah, you had women who were around before Roe and didn't want to go back to that, um, and which probably taps into some of that suburban uh, women voter. But Dane County is a powerhouse. Um, Milwaukee turnout really hasn't rebounded since 2012. And that used to be a problem, but Dane County has more than ever come out at this point. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just actually give a shout out to Professor Paul Jeffries who sent me an article from the Washington Post that looked at uh, Trump-endorsed candidates, and especially in, in competitive districts. And you can look at it from a sort of regression standpoint and see, look at outperformance and underperformance just to kind of get everybody on the same so page here. I'll, I'll just quote what I thought was, was a pretty remarkable section from this article. Uh, Candidates bearing Trump endorsements underperformed their baseline by a whopping five, per, five uh, points, while Republicans who were without Trump's blessing overperformed their baseline by 2.2 points, a remarkable more, uh, difference of more than seven points. Seven points is really a lot when you, when you think about it. So. My, my, my question when I look at these kinds of numbers is, does this signify something larger? Are we seeing sort of truly a shift away from Trumpism and sort of nationalist populism? And if we do see that, what are we, what are we shifting toward? Uh, I'm trying to come up with a short answer to that. Um, you have to divide that question into two. Number one is the overall electorate moving away from it, and then of course there's the more immediate question, but what about the Republican electorate? I mean, what you saw here was a Republican party that has pandered to its own base, and they convinced themselves that all they had to do was to gin up their base and then they would win, and so they got out of the business of persuasion. The question is whether the, or not the, the country is, is, moving, is moving with them. And I think that this is why there's so much angst on, on, among Republicans this week, at least temporarily, um, looking at these results and saying, look, um, if, if, if we stick with Donald Trump, we're going to get, we will lose. I mean, th this is not a, they haven't rediscovered principle or conscience or courage. They're just saying, we could actually start losing elections in a big way because these things do not appeal uh, to the mainstream electorate. Look, um, I think Republicans are hoping that they can have Trumpism without Trump, but it's going to be very difficult for them to get away from him. But I think that the, what the election did show, and I think if any of you that watched Trump on Monday night, there's a real sort of low energy, boring, tired quality to this. And at some point, you know, the fever does break. I don't think we're close to that fever breaking, 
but I think there's a real electoral problem. And we've been talking about Dane County here. But the other major thing to your question is in order to understand Wisconsin, you have to understand that you had a Democratic governor who was not terribly charismatic, elected with, by more than 90,000 votes, in a year in which Milwaukee didn't really turn out. So you had the massive turnout of Dane County, but the real story is also the suburban story, which is a story everywhere in the country, where the wow counties, Waukesha, Ozaukee, and Washington County, used to deliver these massive percentages of votes. And since Donald Trump came on the scene, that margin has gone down. It used to be the wild counties could counteract Dane County and Milwaukee County, and that's not happening. And, and I don't see that coming back. So in terms of the country shifting, and I think what you're seeing is Republicans are like, oh wow, we had been talking ourselves into thinking there was going to be this wave that Donald Trump was going to lead us back into power. And I think now they're sensing that the country is not into that, that the country is not into that kind of uh, the nativism, extremism. Now, of course, we have many countries. We're not one country. So the story in Florida is very different than the story in Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So that's my shorter answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, perhaps we can, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, Wisconsin can uh, turn back a little bit to the, to the Wisconsin uh, races. Um, well, we can focus uh, for a moment on the governor's race uh, and see uh, what, what your thoughts are, you know, you mentioned the governor isn't known for the biggest sort of uh, zingers, uh, even in his post-election speech, uh, the one that has been quoted the most is, uh, some people call it boring, but you know what, Wisconsin, as it, uh, as it turns out, boring wins. Um, so how do you look at, you know, how do you look at this, um, at this race? Are people really like, you know, yearning for boring or, um, you know, let's let's look at some maybe insights. What can we learn from this um, from this race specifically? I mean, I think there are a few things there. Um, if any of you ever watch uh, a Marquette poll presentation, you would have heard over and over again this year that voters are cranky, and that's just true. They weren't really happy with any of the candidates. All of the candidates were a little bit underwater. Um, what I've heard talking to the Evers campaign after the fact, though, is. The, the message that they went with, this doing the right thing for Wisconsin message, which, um, you know, everything from his response to COVID, to roads funding, to education, a lot of people felt like maybe, maybe he didn't do enough, maybe, you know, they wanted Medicaid expansion, they wanted legal marijuana, or maybe he did things that they didn't like, they didn't like the COVID closures, but they felt like he was at least trying to do the right thing. Um, and that, once they, you know, realized that was sticking, they went with it, and I think it was effective. Um, I don't think you would find a Democrat who also wouldn't say that it would have been a lot tougher of a race for them if Rebecca Clayfish had won uh, the, the primary uh, for a number of reasons. One, being a woman from the Wow counties, she would have tapped into that base, I think, a little bit more than the Michaels campaign. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really mentioned the Michaels cam campaign getting outspent. The big attraction of a self-funding candidate is that they're gonna pour money into their campaign. He didn't really spend a lot of money. He spent a ton of money on uh, winning the primary, and then he just kind of stopped. Um, the campaign never really found its footing on issues. Um, he had a lot of vague answers when asked about his policy proposals, um, and voters, I don't think, responded well to that. Yeah, just to bring you know Emily back in, you know, in, in, you know, into the picture here. Um, is there anything that you would like to add, uh, Emily? Uh, it could be about the governor's race, or maybe you have some other thoughts about the Senate race, or even like other other um, races here in Wisconsin. Well, yeah, just to piggy off of what Jesse was saying about the governor's race too, it was one I, I can't pin of who said it, but it was um, a prominent Republican said it's hard to meet. It, it's hard to beat milk toast. And he was, as, during his victory speech, he called himself boring, and, and he, he, he capitalized that. He knows he wasn't some fancy guy, he refers to himself as Mr. Rogers, but it was almost in a sense, like kind of Jesse said, there wasn't really popular candidates, but it was almost people were going into the ballot box of who do I hate the least. Um, also with the Michaels campaign, like Jesse mentioned, I mean, there was no real plan or vision he also, what was difficult for us reporters, there wasn't a lot of public events. So when it came to us trying to tell the public about what he wants to do as governor, it was very big details. If we would try to follow up, we didn't really get much after that. So it was all these headlines of Michaels would be willing or he'd be open to doing that. 
Um, and I, you know, maybe that was their strategy all along, um, so we wouldn't have to say things, but even on the debate stage or in some press gaggles that he did, his campaign often had to walk back what he said. So that also probably, of those that were paying attention, didn't look very well on his part. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to that boring red as normal, and this was a, a theme throughout the, the election, is that voters were comfortable with normal. They, they didn't want crazy. So Tony Evers is a boring, milk toasty kind of guy. But in Arizona, Katie Hobbs was also kind of boring and milk toast against this flamboyant character. And she won um, because she was more normal and less, and less scary. I will also just comment, because Emily is uh, touching on something. Tim Michaels was singularly not ready for prime time. He was recruited to parachute into Wisconsin by people like Reince Priebus and some super lobbyists for the road builders or the John Guards of the world who figured he would be, he'd be useful to, to them. And clearly he was not versed on the issues, did not take the trouble to get versed on the issues, and I think that it showed. I don't know that that was decisive, but I think but between that, well, I mean, you know, look, in Wisconsin, the abortion issue was a binary choice. I mean, we have this abortion law on the books. This became a referendum on abortion. He never figured out how he was going to handle that. He also, because of the Trump ties, came off as an election denier, and I think that hurt him tremendously. So even though it was Trump that got him the nomination, he couldn't really scrape Trump off of his shoes uh, before the general election. I hope he got that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going for subtlety points. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just add, you know, since uh, you know people who know me know that I look at you know the, the the money part quite a bit in these kinds of races, and uh, you know at some point I looked at the governor's race, uh, 115 million dollar, 15 million dollars were spent on both uh, candidates, um, which was the is a, it's the highest level for a state in a state level race that in, you know, in Wisconsin history. Uh, if you're looking at the U.S. and the race here in Wisconsin again. Uh, we're looking at almost $200 billion that were spent in this race. Uh, what again, what stands out to me and what I've been sort of pointing out over the last couple of years is that um, of every dollar, 34 cents were actually raised and spent by the candidates themselves, and 66 cents were spent by these outside groups. Uh, and that has sort of been, a, you know, it's, it's, it has changed elections, you know, has changed races, uh, I think, quite, quite significantly. Um, maybe just to kind of you know, and we actually have a student group here on campus who is currently working on a, on a, on a documentary that will be 20 minutes long on the role of money in, in, in Wisconsin elections. And so, I don't know, you know, they didn't have a chance to interview you guys, but I was wondering what you, what you would, you know, they're also looking at kind of reforming the system in a way that sort of the relevance of money becomes, you know, is becoming, gets you know, less, less important. So. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on like the overarching role of, of money in these kinds of races, and if you have ideas of maybe of how to get money out of it, or at least sort of how to reduce the role of of the of, of the cash. I like Jesse handle that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm kind of a kind of a radical on this. I think I'm actually very much pro transparency over. Um, trying, I think the toothpaste out of the tube, whatever analogy you want to use, like we're not getting money out of politics in any world I could envision. What we can do more of is encourage more transparency in where that money's coming from. Um, it's it's the dark money that's become more of a problem, um, the inability to trace where things are coming from and the inability to hold anyone accountable for those messages. Um, if you look, I think, in the Senate race, most of the really effective negative advertising against Vandale and Barnes wasn't coming from the Ron Johnson campaign. It was coming from outside groups. Um, and when that happens, you know, Ron Johnson isn't doesn't have to answer for what those ads are saying or you know what those attacks look like. Um, so I, I would like to know more about who is spending money and what their deal is and what they want than try to figure out a way to cut off the, the tab. Any thoughts on this, um, Emily? Uh, I mean, I think in general, a lot of Americans are just fed up with the large amounts of money that goes into campaigns, but I think a lot of us in this room know that money makes a difference in campaigns. So I, I don't know how that will ever change, but it is the transparency, like Jesse mentioned, of where it's coming from. And she made a really good point that you see all these negative ads and you want to blame the opponent for doing them, but 
almost 70% of the times, at least the ads I would see, it was like 30% from the actual campaign and 70% was outside spending groups. And I know specifically talking post-election of what hurt certain campaigns was the outside spending on advertising like uh, with Michael's uh, sexual harassment claims against his company that turned off some voters. For Mandela, there was these kind of hardcore commercials that appeared that Mandela was the reason for this rise in crime, you know, the scare tactics. Um, so we saw a lot of those, and the sad thing is um, they can be effective. And while we all get very annoyed of how many political ads we see, um, you know, I think down the road they're not the amount and the mass amounts that we're seeing are not going to change. But letting people know who's funding them and where that money is from is what I think most Americans want to know more about. So I would focus on two things. Um, number one is the, the, the role of the political oligarchy, where you have a handful of mega donors who have just disproportionate impact, uh, both at the federal level and, and locally. I mean, there's just a handful of people who will sit around and decide who will be a candidate for state Supreme Court here in Wisconsin. Jesse and I were just talking about this beforehand. So you, you have, um, and, and that influence uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, the second thing, though, is the way that politics has really been transformed um, by the small donor base, um, the direct uh, direct access. So, for example, you know, it used to be that if you wanted to get a lot of money, you had to go to your party leadership and you had to toe the line, or you had to, in, in Washington D.C., go to you know major corporations and get you know money from their PACs. Now, the I think the in terms of your view on that. The, uh, the center of gravity has really shifted to this small donor base so that a Marjorie Taylor Greene can get kicked off committees, say the craziest things, but she can still be a rock star and a major fundraiser because she knows what buttons to push from the grassroots. And it also means that when one of the crazies goes into the office of the speaker and the speaker says, well, we're going to cut you off from the campaign funds, that person says, I don't care. I can get more money by going online and you know, ginning up the you know, and the and the wilder and more reckless I am, the more money I'm likely to raise. And that is really affecting, I think, the balance of power in our politics. And I don't know, by the way, how you solve that problem because that really is, you know, a, you know, very democratic when you think about it in terms of that. It's not one guy writing out a big check. That's one problem. It's the people who are writing out their social security checks to the craziest person on the ballot. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, it was just yesterday in class that we had that discussion about the small donor revolution. Um, and again, I don't want to take over here and uh, I will just say um, on a really positive note, I think what we see is, and it, you know, I think one real positive thing also about the election obviously is, uh, is voter turnout. You know, there's people are worried about cynicism and people stepping out of the system. Um, the small, you know, once you are a stakeholder, even if you make those small donations, right, uh, it really shows that people are, are tuned in, and I think that's overall a very sort of a positive aspect. I want to shift, you know, because our time is limited, to kind of looking forward a little bit and looking at sort of the next, next two years, let's say, right, in terms of both Congress but also here in Wisconsin. Um, yeah, what, what major piece of legislation can we can we expect out of Congress, out of the Wisconsin legislature, um, in you know in the foreseeable future? Um, and if you don't see anything, what what else can we expect from from um, from both in terms of um, um, priorities? Um, I think at the Wisconsin level, the big question is whether the parties can actually find a way to get along. Um, you know, the last four years. Republicans' biggest goal was to keep Tony Evers from getting any legislative wins. Um, it turns out that didn't help them on election day. So you know there there may be less incentive to you know, try to railroad him as much as they did. Um, uh, Assembly Speaker Robin Voss has signaled some openness. Um, Charlie and I were talking about this beforehand that he's he's talking about compromise in a way that he hasn't before. Um, on the other hand, Republicans have a giant majority and they're not gonna have all their ducks in a row because it's a lot of people and a lot of personalities to manage. Um, the Senate's kind of a different question, but there's a lot of turnover coming through the legislature, and so we don't, I think, know exactly how all these personalities are gonna work with, with each other just yet. Um, but, you know, it's, 
<laughs> there's a budget coming up, um, that's a big fight, so it's, it's the time to find out what everyone's priorities are, whether it's tax cuts, more spending on edu education. I think one of the big issues that Tony Evers has hammered on and, and that you hear a lot from local governments is shared revenue. Um, you, you see kind of record levels of uh, communities passing uh, referendums to you know, uh, get more money for the things that they need because it's not coming from the state government. Uh, I think it'd be hard pressed to find a lot of Republicans in the legislature who want to uh, raise levy limits or, or increase that shared revenue, but um, I think it, it, it came up even during the Republican primary. We were having even Republican voters asking about it. So I think there's gonna be some pressure on them to, to address that in the budget. Yeah, the things that we've already heard of so far to piggyback off what Jesse was saying, um, but with possible compromise, um, Robin Voss, after their assembly caucus, did kind of have this little bit shift of tone that I think he's kind of realizing, like a lot of Republicans in divided government, well, we're stuck here for another four years. Do we not, we want another four years of gridlock, or do we actually want to get something done? Um, so, those, the, you know, one area he floated, but I'm very skeptical about, is a possible compromise on adding exceptions for rape or incest to Wisconsin's 1849 criminal abortion ban. Of course, that right now is being litigated. Governor Evers rather have that issue be dealt with with the courts, but Voss is trying to give some sort of peace offering that, well, maybe we can work on this. Uh, he also floated, you know, Republicans for a very long time who wanted to expand school choice. You know, they don't want to talk about the price tag or how they would get that done, but that's something that Evers this week said, sure, maybe, but I want to see the proposal. Um, Evers, in trade, boss said, well, if you, if you want more money for education, let's expand school choice. We'll see where that debate is, too. Taxes, like Jesse mentioned, are definitely on the line. Evers floated uh, introducing his middle tax inc or his middle income tax cut again. He introduced that in August, uh, using some of the state surplus. Uh, meanwhile, Republicans have floated a flat tax and something else. So maybe it's taxes. I'm thinking is one thing they could come to an agreement with. But the big question in the state legislature is what will lawmakers do with the projected five billion dollar state surplus? And we will have to stay tuned. <laughs> Let me pick up on that point. Sure. That, that makes compromise a lot easier when you have a lot of extra money floating around, so that, that may happen. Um, I think we can look forward to gridlock at both, uh, both levels of, of government. But having said this, the Robin Voss story is awfully interesting for those of you that want to get a little bit wonky, because he was one of those mainstream Republicans who figured, okay, I can appease the Trumpist base. I can you know, throw red meat to the baby alligator in the tub, and then he was surprised to find out it kept growing and then wanted to eat him. <laughs> Remember, he went along with election denial for a while, appointed justice, uh, former Justice Gableman to that absurd uh, investigation, which everybody knew was absurd except Michael Gableman and a couple of <laughs> other folks. And they got Trump very much involved in this, demanding that, uh, that Robin Voss decertify Wisconsin. And Voss is saying, guys, that's not legal. I can't do this. And they went for him. They tried to defeat him in the primary. They laundered money through various local you know, political parties to try to defeat him. So Robin Voss is somebody all out of bleach to give when it comes to Trump, um, and may have a different attitude toward compromise because he had a near-death experience because of this. I'm also really interested to watch what does Mitch McConnell do in the United States Senate? Because he's all out of uh, you know what to give with uh, with Trump as, as, as well, so even though there'll be tremendous pressure not to compromise on legislation, he will do it. Now I know you wanted to move on, but I need to throw this in here because we talked a lot about the governor's race. I am still blindingly frustrated at the political malpractice of Democrats in Wisconsin, who had the most vulnerable incumbent Republican senator. And they blew that race. And, um, and I know these are the most obnoxious words in politics, but I'm going to say them. I told you so about this. Ron Johnson um, had an approval rating in the mid-30s. He was saying crazy stuff all the time. He was embarrassing. He was alienating voters. Democrats proved this year that they can turn out their votes. So here's three numbers to keep in mind. Tony Evers wins by 90,000 votes, which is amazing. Was it more than that in 93? Okay, I'm rounding these up, which is amazing. 
Democrats turned out across the state. They lowered the, the margin. So this was there. Those votes were there. Tony Evers got 23,000 more votes than Ron Johnson. So if everybody that voted for Ron Johnson, I'm sorry, everybody that voted for Tony Evers, the Democrat for governor, also voted for the Democrat for Senate, you would have had a relatively comfortable win for the Democrats against Ron Johnson. Remember, um, elections in Wisconsin have been decided by 20,000 votes for some time. So you take the Evers vote, match it up with Johnson, 23,000 votes. Unfortunately, Mandela Barnes got more than 50,000 fewer votes than Tony Evers. He underperformed Tony Evers by 50,000 votes. So this goes back to the normie versus the extremist. People were comfortable with the normal candidates, but the perception with Barnes was that he was too far out of the mainstream. There was just too much baggage. And one of the things that what really frustrated me was when there was a crowded primary, I would tell people, I would say, look, you understand what it's going to look like after the Republicans drop $20 million worth of aqua research on Mandela Barnes. And then what the Democrats did was they cleared the field for him. They had every, all of the others, all of the centrists, all of the other people without the baggage to get out of the way. So what it meant was that Barnes rolls out of that primary completely untested and unvetted, and there was this $20 million bomb about to drop on his head. And there was no way. So you had at least 50,000 people, roughly, who were saying, I'm willing to vote for a Democrat for governor, but you're asking too much for me to vote for this. And you know, we talk a lot about terrible candidate quality of the Republicans, how many races the Republicans blew because they didn't have electable candidates. Well, at some point, Wisconsin's going to have to come to grips with the candidate uh, quality problem right here, because that's why Ron Johnson's going to be back in the Senate for another six years. OK, so there's my <laughs> Well, I'm glad you mentioned it, because uh, I think you're right that there is so much discussion about just you know, what are the lessons for Republicans without paying attention to Democrats uh, uh, and the kinds of maybe sometimes really too progressive candidates that they run with some baggage and then who said, who you said were untested. Uh, at least we at the, at the center have been sort of trying to be balanced and we brought Alex Lazary, for example, here for, for a conversation, but of course then he dropped out sort of uh, just before, before the election. All right, my last question, and there's a very, a bit of a question, you know, or my, my request for a brief answer. Uh, if we just look ahead and, uh, you know, we schedule the event for tonight so that President Trump could declare his candidacy for the Republican nomination, so how do you see this playing out? Uh, if you had to kind of, you know, uh, put your chips on the table and say, will Republicans ultimately break with Trump uh, because they see the DeSantis as a much more polished candidate, a much more electable candidate, or is Trump still able to gonna pull off the nomination um, at the end of the day? You want a short answer there? Short answer, but you will, you will go last. Okay. <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of people like the Robin Bosses of the world who desperately want this to happen. I don't think the party's quite there yet. Um, I think if you look at the uh, Wisconsin con congressional delegation, we're already getting mixed messages on this. Um, Scott Fitzgerald said, told the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel a few days ago that it's time to move on from Trump. And uh, Emily tweeted this earlier today. Uh, Emily spoke with him, and he said, oh, gosh, no, <laughs> we, we shouldn't. We shouldn't drop Trump yet. So um, I, I don't think that we should be expecting a, a big movement there. Uh, what do you think, Emily? Well, I'll pick up after that. Yeah, we're kind of seeing a little bit of a tone shift. I don't know if Trump called Fitzgerald, but I'm just joking. But you know, that, that was kind of a little bit odd uh, that just on Monday before Trump announced his candidacy, he told the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel that, you know, I think it's time to move on. And then he told me today, oh, absolutely not. You know, we can't, you know, he has such a big following. You know, and that's the, that's the big question, right? I mean, can Republicans win without Trump supporters? I think there's room, but those Trump supporters need to come to terms with that. Um, so I think we're starting to, I think it's, it's going to take more prominent Republicans to talk about 
Trump or against Trump and saying now it's time to start dissing ourselves to maybe start changing people's minds. Um, I don't think I can make a prediction right now, but um, like kind of what Jesse said, I think people are really, um, some people like the Robin Bosses are, are really hoping there's, there's someone else that will be the nominee. Okay, Charlie. Well, I've actually written columns this week making both arguments. <laughs> on, on, I, I've spoken out of both sides of my mouth. So for MSNBC, I have a column basically okay. saying the Republicans are stuck with him because he, his, his basic threat is, if it's not me, I'm prepared to burn down the house. I don't care what I destroy, I will take my 30% and I will go home, and you're, 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 you're done. That plays to their greatest fears. On the other hand, I also wrote a piece, what if this time is different? Um, what if uh, Republican voters and leaders decide that it's time to turn the page? What if the field does coalesce um, around, say, Ron DeSantis as opposed to having a, a mixed field? Um, what happens if the base does not rally after he is uh, inevitably indicted? Um, they, they may be inflamed, uh, but they may see this as another sign that he's not electable. Uh, what if he continues to come off not just as a loser, but as a boring loser, which he did on Tuesday night. Having said all that, and I bear the scars of all of this, we've been through this before, haven't we? This is a party that did not break with him after Access Hollywood, after he mocked POWs. They didn't break with him after Helsinki, when he kissed up to Vladimir Putin, or after Charlottesville, where he praised neo-Nazis. They didn't break with him after he was defeated in the election. They did not break with him after he fomented an attack on the Capitol to overturn the election. So why would we think they would break with him now? So until they do it, the, the, the assumption has to be that he is the front runner for the Republican nomination. So something has to happen that hasn't happened before, that the Republican base is willing to move on and that someone is willing to stand up to him. And we don't know this. No one knows this. Does, does Ron DeSantis have a glass jaw? Is he prepared for two years of nicknames and personal attacks? Uh, we don't know. What we are seeing, though, is the Murdochs have bailed on Trump in a rather radical way, um, which will include Fox News. We're seeing the donor class turning against him as if the big donors make a difference. So um, it doesn't have the same vibe that it had in 2016 and 2020, but we're talking about a political party that has caved in, rationalized, and enabled him at every single stage. And so until that changes, you have to assume that that will be the future as well. And we could also have uh, some media outlets and looking at like how the Wall Street Journal, for well, example. Well, that's the Murdochs. I yeah, mean, the, yeah, the Wall Street Journal, the New York, did everybody see how the New York Post <laughs> Handled, handled this? Okay, so yeah. Murdoch's own Fox News, which is the big one, but New York Post is the tabloid, which is uh, Donald Trump's hometown newspaper. He got this. The day after he announced, they had a, like a little bit, uh, ribbon along the bottom. Florida man makes announcement. Florida. <laughs> and then on page 26, this little sort of snarky little article, which could not have been more savage as a message from the Murdochs that we are done with you. Well, you have been very patient with the, you know, us uh, as an audience, and so now I want to open it up to your questions. Of course, we also love questions from students. Uh, Daniel. Uh, what's your opinion on polling? Like, do you think it's effective anymore? Like, what, what are the problems? What, what happened to the problems? What could they do to fix it? And how did polling actually really work in this uh, in this past election? Um, yeah, I think we saw some some national polls that didn't do particularly well. The um, Trafalgar poll was pretty embarrassingly off. Um, but when you look within the state, um, the Marquette poll, kind of the gold standard here, it, it was pretty close. Especially if you look at the margin of error from poll to poll, um, you saw some things that looked like big swings, but might not have necessarily been um, as dramatic as, as they appear. Uh, from the top lines. So I, I, I think uh, they're still figuring it out. Um, you know, polls are just one piece of information. You've probably heard this a million times before. They're a snapshot in time. It's not a prediction. It's a temperature check on the electorate. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how to continue to reach people. But, um, you know, there's no doubt that that's difficult, whether that's 
um, you know, online surveys, text messages, phone calls. Um, you know, people don't really answer their phones anymore. So they've, they've got challenges to overcome, but I, I don't think the polls are, are dead yet. Just to, to, to follow up on that, this is the important distinction. There are some really, really good polls that did pretty well in this difficult environment like the Marquette University poll, but there are a lot of trash polls out there. And there are a lot of garbage polls that get touted by the media, and you know Trafalgar being one of them. And I think this is a problem, a little bit more quality control. Stop reporting them, stop putting them in the aggregators, the real clear politics average. What does that mean? What is an average, you know, if you have four really good polls you know, and three really you know, crappy ones. So um, that's part of the problem. And, and the other part, though, is we also have a pundit problem. Did you notice how the, the, the hive mind of the media went to, OK, so um, there's going to be this big red wave. It's, it's huge. It's going to be. And everyone kept repeating that, that conventional wisdom. And I remember having a conversation with somebody saying, OK, I can't say this in public because, of course, we all know there's going to be a huge red wave. But you notice how the poll numbers don't really show that? The data's not there, but it was all the vibes. And everybody kept repeating it. And so there is this sort of sense where everybody you know, talks to one another and I think created that sort of media dynamic, which was actually in some ways worse than the polling misses. All right, so other questions? Yes, Marty. Uh, just putting Wisconsin kind of in regional context, uh, Michigan re-elected a Democratic governor and Democrats took both houses of the state legislature. Minnesota re-elected a Democratic governor, Democrats took both houses of the state legislature. Wisconsin re-elects a Democrat <laughs> governor and almost has a two-thirds majority of Republicans in the state legislature. What is going on? I know it's gerrymandering, but this is, again, quickly, Ripon has been put into a district which is now so far flung that both the candidates, I'm talking about the assembly district, but I know that the 6th district has also been, if anything, made more Republican, but we're now in a district with Lodi, which is almost Madison, we have no media in common with them. We have no commerce in common with them. Most people don't even know where it is. And both the candidates came from Lodi. It's all this extreme gerrymandering. What can we do about this? I will say, yes, gerrymandering does play a role. Um, but I think abortion also made a difference. Um, Wisconsin was different than all those other states that you named that abortion, in a sense, was on the ballot, was at risk. That's how Governor Tony Evers ran his campaign. That's primarily what he focused on, and it worked. Um, in Michigan, I believe they had a ballot initiative that drove out Democrat support. It was something along the lines, someone can correct me, but you know, should we repeal it? Should we keep protections in place? Yada, yada, yada. Other of the states around Wisconsin, neighboring states, didn't have abortion on the ballot. I think that's what made the difference, in my opinion beyond redistricting and new maps. Um, and one thing I would add to that is just the issue of ballot initiatives. I think um, it's worth noting that Wisconsin doesn't have direct ballot initiatives. So um, on issues that maybe are very popular with voters like uh, you know, undoing gerrymandering or uh, you know, it's, it, that's an overwhelmingly popular issue, but Wisconsinites don't have a mechanism by which to take that to the ballot where uh, other states like Michigan and Ohio can do that. Just quickly, Evers called a special session with that on the agenda to allow that, and they adjourned without yes. discussion, correct? Correct. Just two, two things about your point. I mean, first of all, I want to get to the redistricting thing in a, in a, in a moment, but the, what you're describing is, is really interesting. We've had a lot of focus on how uh, Republican Florida has become, but look at Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin lesser, but, but Minnesota. Donald Trump won the White House by winning Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and coming very close in Minnesota. What's happened since then? Those have slipped further and further, further away from them. This is a real crisis. But you do highlight this weird thing, and everybody, everywhere I go will always ask me, what is with the Wisconsin legislature? It is so bizarre. We are a 50-50 state, and yet it is so overwhelming. 
This is a much harder problem than it looks. There is some bad faith gerrymandering, no question about it. On the other hand, if you look at the map, you have Democratic voters super concentrated in Milwaukee and in Dane County. The rest of the state is relatively Republican. How do you draw lines to account for how compact the electorate is? I mean, so this is, this is, and this is a dilemma elsewhere, you'd almost have to have these huge wagon wheel spokes that would go out, that would make your Rip and Lodi thing seem like child's play. You would have to have, you know, in order to get these districts to be competitive. So part of what's happening is the way we've sorted ourselves out into these super majority areas. And so, um, yeah, gerrymandering, but the sorting out has been a factor as well. Yeah, from self-sorting voters to Paul Jeffries. <laughs> um, first an observation and then kind of an observation that may lead into a touchy question. Um, the I, I think in the governor's race, the key thing that sunk Michaels was that quote that came out late in the campaign about if I win, there'll be no, you know, Republicans will never lose an election. I. I that was the death knell, in my view, and it seemed like that was pretty strategic. Um, in terms of the Senate race, though, um, I this is going to be hard to say, but I think race sunk the Senate race. I don't think. I mean, when you look, that Democrats won every other statewide position. And the bar, you know, all this advertising, all, you know, a lot of the money was, he's different, he's radical, the darkening. I think he lost because of racism across the state. Because I think if you take that out, I, I think it's plausible he would have won. I, I, and I can't come up with another reasonable explanation um, apart from that. So the question is, what, what role did uh, race play in that, uh, in that race? Well, it's really important, though, to, to underline what you just said about some of those ads where they darkened his skin and they say, uh, you know, Mandela Barnes, different. Right. And then they would have him pictured with other minorities. And, and this was not subtle. This was not a dog whistle. There was clearly uh, a racial under, undertone to that. So, I mean, let's, let's start with that. Do recall this is a state that's voted for, that voted for Barack Obama twice, though, before we go to the race card. Um, I think that the margin was such, though, that that's too easy an explanation. Now, the reason I was cautioning against Mandela Barn saying that he was unelectable was not because he was black, but because he had taken so many positions that were toxic involving defunding the police, abolishing ICE. This is a guy that goes on Russian, you know, RT television to bash cops, who tweeted out praise of, you know, Khomeini from Iran, who has, you know, said that he wanted to be, what was the line he had about Assad's regime, that he, that he, that he, I mean, it, there was so much about this guy, you know, saying how, you know, that, that he really loved the squad, that he was, you know, the, you know, you know that he really admired, they, they were the rock stars. His positions were so easily exploitable by the Republicans because he had such a paper trail and he was untested. And so when people say, well, Sammy Tammy Baldwin was a progressive as well, but Tammy Baldwin is a veteran politician and she's very, very good at it. He had never been tested. He'd never really won a race like this. And every Republican I know just knew how big that book was, how many things he had said. And so, yes, race was a major factor, but this was a year in which Democrats turned out their people. And there were a lot of those people, they would have to be, the racists that you're, you're talking about are people who voted for Tony Evers. There's 50,000 of them, okay? Right. Oh, no, I, the other, the, the, I don't the other, say that it goes in that well, direction. And, and, the, and the other big fail for the Democrats was the theory of the case for Mandela Barnes was that he was the only candidate that could turn out the African-American vote in Milwaukee and turn out the Dane County vote, but Milwaukee did not turn out for him. Right. And I do appreciate that. Just because it's an important question, anything else you, you, would, you would add, either Emily, or to this, to this question? 
pretty much echo everything Charlie said. I don't think you can take race out of the equation if there's no doubt that that played a role. Um, those ads, like Charlie said, there weren't dog whistles. There, there was nothing subtle about that. Um, but he, you know, Mandel Barnes really struggled from not having a tough primary. He didn't get attacked at all during the primary. He didn't. Um, they, they cleared the field. I think that was a huge mistake for Democrats. Um, they deprived him of a hard-fought victory, and. All of the things that, that Charlie mentioned, those attacks, everyone knew that they were coming and they didn't have answers for them. Um, and they, they did not adequately fight back on, on some of those things. I, I might add though, Billy <coughs> Nose versus Johnson strike and, and what Johnson said throughout his entire career, that's equally as problematic. But everybody as, knows Ron Johnson. Well, okay. Well, Mandel Barnes had to define himself and introduce himself. Everybody knows Ron Johnson has an opinion about him. That's the frustration. There's a question in the back, yes. Now that the uh, Republicans have uh, gained control of the House, it looks like uh, we're in for a long litany of Benghazis. And I'm wondering if the panel could address their opinions on how that might play out over the next two years. Will that be a plus for them? by 2024, or will the American people say, we've had enough of that? I will just uh, repeat the question. It's, it's about uh, investigations uh, in Congress and how it's going to play out, and may it be on Hunter Biden and various other kinds of um, investigations. I mean, I'll, I'll start it off. I mean, I think Republicans are going to use it to their advantage. Um, a lot of Republicans are frustrated and upset still from the investigations into Trump and the impeachment of Trump. So they're seeing this as their time to shine. Um, will they get something accomplished? Who knows? Um, but uh, was it fuel for the 2020 presidential election for Democrats? Absolutely. So I think that's what they're building up momentum mm -hmm. for is for 2024 and to put Biden <coughs> on the spotlight, put Biden in the headlines because they weren't getting them before. Oh, I think it's going to be a clown car on fire. Um, it, you know, think about this. T today was the first day that they really had the majority. And, um, of course, the first thing they did was to unveil their plan for fighting inflation and dealing with economic anxiety. And, no, I'm kidding. No, it was like we're going after Hunter Biden. Um, and I think that the, the problem is they have such a small minority, they have such a small majority that uh, this, tr this clown car is going to be driven by the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Lauren Boberts and the Paul Gosars and the most extreme folks out there. And, and, I, and I think that the real danger of, of any new majority is that we'll, they will overreach. But a tiny minority um, being led by some of the most extreme factions is in many ways the worst case scenario. Because I think Democrats will be able to point to them and say, look, they said they were going to actually do things that you care about and instead they're doing this other stuff that, frankly, you don't even understand what they're talking about if you haven't been on the QAnon message board. I mean, you, just, you, you can't even follow the things they're talking about. So I think the potential for backfiring is tremendous at this point. Um, and again, if you've ever watched some of the people who are the, the leads on this investigation, if you've watched them in, in action, you know, they're not bringing their best. They're not bringing their best people. So um, Kevin McCarthy may try to rein them in, but if he's only got a two, three vote margin, then basically they, they got his you know what in the lockbox and nothing will stop it. There was a question here, uh, Austin. So we saw in 2022 that the Secretary of State elections with election deniers, uh, they lost handily. But they still won by over 40%, and I think all of their races. Carrie Lake won, or excuse me, lost by only like 20,000 votes in Arizona. Now, election denial seems to be a losing, a losing uh, idea. But still, 40% of people voted for these people. Was 2022 a, a high water mark for election denial, and like it's going to subside? Uh, subside or are we going to still see this in 2024? Okay, that's an outstanding question. Because, um, yes, they all lost, but I do think it is worth reminding ourselves how big a deal it was and how close some of them came. So yes, Kerry Lake, one of the most deplorable candidates ever to run, 
you know, came within maybe a half percentage point, you know, less than a percentage point. This is not going away. This is in the water. And so I think that the answer is, yes, you won, but you need to remain vigilant. The threat has not gone away. On the other hand, I don't usually say something optimistic, but I thought it was interesting the number of candidates that lost that were willing to concede. Carrie Lake is saying she's not going to concede, but you knew that, right? I mean, you knew because that's what she does. But almost everybody else, even people like Doug Mastriano, this extreme QAnon election denier, he conceded. You know, Boldick in, in, North, in, uh, in New Hampshire uh, con conceded. Dr. Oz conceded. All around the country, none of them did what Donald Trump did back in 2020. And I think in some ways, maybe that's a good omen. The people decided, people are sick of this, I'm not going to litigate this, I'm not going to lead an attack on the capital of Michigan after I've lost this election. So maybe it was a high water mark, but I would think, you know, it would be naive to think that this is not still out there in the environment in a big way. I will just say too, as you know, a political reporter, I was also shocked that there was people making concession speeches yeah. and that we, most of the time there is an election week, we all know that, it like almost never ends, but a lot of us Capitol reporters were just preparing for the worst because we had this Gableman investigation, because we had people talking about election denialism for months and months and months and months. But it, it felt just like a fresh start, yeah. <laughs> um, that we weren't there. And, and to be honest, it felt good, but it was almost like, wow, I'm not reporting on that this week. So it, it, I'm just speaking Wisconsin, but also nationally too, it, like what Charlie mentioned. I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a change of tone, and I personally was just not expecting that. Yeah. So it, it could be a start of something. Like, it's not great that the bar is so low that we were all like, oh my God, people are conceding. But it's true, it's 100% true. We were not expecting that here, and um, you know that's that's probably something to be optimistic about. But um, it, it's true; it's definitely still out there. I mean, I, I interview voters. I you know, went to the Trump rally when he came for Tim Michaels. Like they're they're out there, and it's still prevalent. But it was very encouraging to see candidates concede, which is really sad they could say. Yeah, um, I saw Paul, and then Linda. Paul first. Uh, on the question about why there wasn't a red wave nationally. Uh, a pink something or other, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, why wasn't the economy, uh, inflation in particular, uh, so so uh, harmful to the chances of the Democrats? That ahead of time uh, was listed as likely to be a reason why there was going to be a red wave. James Carville's it's the economy stupid, it's famous, and, and often the economic concerns have been really important in those national elections. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if you think Right, and you gave, you've given other important reasons uh, for the results that we had on, on Henrik's first question. But I'm wondering if also part of it is that the actually, in, although inflation has been a problem, uh, it's getting somewhat better, and that in general most people feel that the economy isn't really too bad, not nearly as bad as the fears uh, of, of, of its impact were. Would you say that uh, from, from your impressions with, with voters or about voters, they weren't too concerned about the economic situation and therefore used these other reasons for their voting, the, the Dobbs decision and the denialism and all the other things that you talked about. Just to summarize the question real quick, uh, there is maybe perhaps kind of some kind of paradox where in the poll numbers show that uh, inflation and the economy is number one in terms of issues at the same time, you would think that it would, it would, it would reflect and kind of hurt Democrats uh, more than it actually did. Why is that? Well, that is a great question. I uh, was wondering the same thing. So I, on, on my podcast, I had uh, Tim O'Brien from Bloomberg uh, opinion on it. And his answer, I wish I, I'm going to paraphrase it, was that in, people did, you know, hated inflation. They weren't worried about the economy. But it was just one aspect of their relationship to the economy. And really, as long as people have jobs, they may be annoyed that they're paying more for gas, but if they have jobs, their neighbors have jobs, they're basically feeling pretty okay. And even if they don't like the price of chicken, they're not gonna vote for somebody who is going to destroy democracy or, or take away a woman's right to choose. So I think that that was the answer that, is that, you know, and the polls had a hard time breaking that out because yes, I really hate inflation. Inflation is a very, very big issue. Does it mean I'm gonna vote for somebody who is batshit crazy? No, um, it's not. 
couple things. Um, yeah, the, the sort of what was on the line, I think, made a huge difference. Yeah, no one likes to pay a lot for gas. No one is happy about it, but um, unemployment's low. Um, people are generally doing okay. And then there was the question of, you know, yeah, women's rights being taken away or the, the possibility of democracy collapsing. That, the stakes are a little higher there. Um, I think the other thing to look at too is the partisan breakdown of <laughs> where these issues fell for voters. Um, you know, there were really stark differences. I'll go back to the Marquette poll again on this. Uh, you know, crime. If you, if you looked at the things that were motivating Republican voters over the course of the election, the list changed a lot. Like there, there wasn't like one thing. So it was crime, you know, one month, and then it's illegal immigration another month. Which, you know, what? So at, at the same time, you know, for Democrats, abortion was really at the top of the list or near the top of the list for most of the election. And when you're looking at base turnout and driving, you know, which party shows up more, they had a, a stronger motivating issue. One other thing I will add is that. Um, not every voter is well informed, but you know, inflation in a sense isn't one person to blame. Um, I know that there was a lot of national and state stories of just explainers, like who's to blame for high gas prices? Who's to blame for my groceries going up? You also have to think about um, some people might have had it much worse um, way back when, uh, you know, during the housing market crash. So it's like, well, yes, chicken and my turkey for Thanksgiving is gonna, you know, break the bank. Um, this time around, but oh, do you remember just you know 20 years ago how, how much worse it was, etc. So I think that could have also um, played a role as well. And I'll add one more point, and maybe the voters don't think that way too much. But uh, of course, inflation isn't just you know, Congress going crazy on spending. It's also you know the Federal Reserve uh, being late on raising interest rates, and then suddenly you know increasing the 75 basis points constantly, and just. Uh, you know, uh, every, you know, people know about that, and it's certainly not your congressperson's fault, and it's not your local, you know, uh, um, candidate's fault. So, um, we're next to next, Linda was next. And this question is specifically for Charlie because he brought it up. I agree that the Democratic uh, that the Democrats should have won the Senate seat. There's no doubt in my mind, and I also agree that the Democratic Party of Wisconsin really screwed it up. So how do you think they screwed it up? What did they do? Well, let me say something positive first, though, that the Democratic Party of Wisconsin did an amazing job turning out its own voters, I mean, turning out the voters for, for governor. Um, they did the best they could. They prevented a supermajority. The party has gotten its act together. I was not privy uh, to the discussions where everybody decided it's got to be Mandel and everybody's got to drop out. I don't honestly, maybe just knows this, who pulled the trigger and all, the, all of that, because I know that Democrats that I have been talking to all year were completely aware of this problem of, of electability. This is, not, this is not an outlier. This is not something that just fell out of the sky. So I don't know exactly how it happened, but. But I don't recall anything like this ever happening before, which is why I really think we need to have a little bit of introspection um, and e examination of that. Why, you know, Alex Lazary had a lot of money. Um, you had a, you know, a number of other candidates who I'm about to forget. You know, Sarah Godlewski, I think. You know, I mean, Matt. So what, what would have happened if Sarah Godlewski had been on that ballot? You know, next to Tony Evers. You know, two weeks ago. I think it would have been different, but I don't know. Do you know how they, why they pulled the trigger like that? Uh, no. I mean, I, if you look at the order that it happened, you know, Tom Nelson did it first, and he was not yeah. part of the bigger picture conversations, right? That was a decision he made on his own, and he was never going to win that race. I think he just decided that this is the way to do it. Um, Lazary dropping out was a huge surprise, um, and I think you know, I, I know that Sarah Gabuski did not start that week planning to drop out of the race. Um, that Tom Nelson did and Alex Lazary did, and you know, within 24 hours, she felt whatever pressure she did to do that. But yeah, Republicans that I talked to throughout the race were terrified of running against her in a way that they were not uh, against, yeah. you know, a Mandel Barnes or for that matter, a Tom Nelson, who's also pretty far to the left on a lot of the issues. I mean, if you want to kind of go based on issues, but uh, I, I don't know who's responsible for that. <laughs> Well, I just know talking amongst uh, uh, some of the candidates and just Democrat strategists, no one wanted to go negative in the race. And 
I mean, if you watch those primary debates, they were pretty boring. I think Tom Nelson had one moment out of it when he kind of made some strong statement. Um, gosh, so long ago, I can't remember, but uh, uh, no one wanted to go negative. And if you don't want to attack your opponent, I mean, it kind of just levels off the race. And I also agree with Jesse, I heard the same things that a lot of people didn't want to go up against uh, Gottlewski. And I think at that moment, once Nelson Lazary dropped out, she was getting pressured to clear the field. And here's the failure of dark outside money, because I think what they were counting on, nobody wanted to go negative themselves, but they were hoping that some national organization would come in and drop the money and basically do it for them. And I think there was a lot of agitation about that or expectation, and that never materialized. Uh, so these independent expenditures, which we often you know, you know, com complain about, play a major role, but the candidates don't have direct control over it. So in retrospect, should the National Democratic Party have come in or were some group of donors? It didn't happen. Yeah, I think those last ones are really, really good. Uh, last row. Okay, I, uh, I wanted to zero in on something that, that Mr. Sykes said um, about the punditry problem. I, I'd come in here with a, a different idea about left-right perspective, but, but um, what, what you said about the punditry problem um, the, the red wave caught, idea caught on. Uh, I also got irritated by all this talk about uh, inflationary government spending. And when when a candidate says it, it's like, well, candidates do a lot of love. But when opponents start repeating it, it's like, wait a minute, shouldn't you dig up the research? This is, a, this is an institution of higher learning. We should base ourselves on research and data. And you look at the research and in, Government spending does not have much effect on inflation, not compared to all the outside factors we had bearing in this year, like post-pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. And I think people caught on to that. But what it reminded me of, the whole red wave talk, inflationary spending talk, it reminded me of weapons of mass destruction. Now, some of the younger kids might not remember this. But the whole punditry caught on to that weapons of mass destruction, you know, back in the early Bush years. Um, for the Iraq war. The reason we have to go to war in Iraq is because they have weapons of mass destruction and we never found them. Shouldn't the punditry do their research before they do their talking? So the question to summarize <laughs> is that how do we get out of a sort of a punditry yeah. system that uh, is more of an echo chamber, it's just you know, an, an echo chamber and reflects uh, groupthink? Uh, I mean, punditry is not the same as journalism. Let's start with that, I guess. Um, you know, the, it's the job of journalists to, to do that, the research and, you know, get to the bottom of those things. It's the job of pundits to analyze and entertain and provide fodder for, you know, the next conversation. So, uh, yeah, it'd be great if that could change, but it's a pretty good business. <laughs> Well, okay, so we, we could spend an hour talking about this. <laughs> I think one of the biggest problems that you'll see, and this is really across the board, is you know, next time you watch on cable television, CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, watch the number of people who are giving opinions that are actually independent journalists versus the number who are themselves consultants or basically partisan mouthpieces. And one of the things that's happened is that a lot of the people that you're on with are paid to express this point of view. They're not giving you an honest, straightforward, you know, independent analysis. I'm not saying dishonest, but they're not giving you an independent analysis. They are on the payroll of this advocacy organization, or they are working for this organization. And so they're giving you those talking points. So when Jesse says, don't confuse punditry with journalism, this is a real problem. Um, you know, when, and, and I've been on panels where half the people there are trying to give what they think of as an independent answer, and then the other two, you know, are just sitting there going, they're just reading out what you know what they're supposed to read out, and do the listeners make the distinction? Um, because sometimes you'll hear somebody say something that's like a la la land or complete wish casting or just some bizarre take, and it might be because not because they believe it, but because they're on this particular committee or anything. And I think that's something that journalism, that the media has to become a little bit more careful of because it's easy and it's lazy to put the hacks on. Um, 
but I think it, 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 it erodes public confidence. Well, it struck my mind. Yeah. I remember we had some of in this country who said, I was in Iraq, there are no weapons of mass destruction, and the media completely ignored it. We have time for one last question. Yes. Um, given that the Democrats technically barely did win a majority in the, in the um, Senate, how important do you think the Georgia runoff in the Senate will end up being in the end of January? Barry? <laughs> no, huge, huge, because um, the, w the way the Senate works, 50-50 uh, Senate, all the committees are evenly divided. 51-49, um, the Democrats will have a majority in each one of the committees. So it will streamline the way things are done. So I, I think it makes a big difference. And I think, by the way, the way this is played out gives a lot of momentum uh, to Raphael Warnock right now, because the justification for people down in Georgia was, Okay, so Herschel Walker's a hypocrite and a liar and completely unfit, but we need him in order to take control of the Senate, you know, so that the godless, you know, uh, uh, communistic Marxist Democrats do not control the Senate. Well, now Senate control is no longer on, on the line. It's harder to rationalize uh, for some voters, I think, vote, you know, holding their nose and voting for Herschel Walker. So, but it makes a, really a huge difference, 51. I know it shouldn't, but it does. Actually, I want to finish with uh, uh, with the way my pre you know my former uh, co-director Brian Smith. I would like to finish sort of events and say, do you have any parting thoughts for us? Uh, any 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 final words that you want to sort of leave us with for tonight? Um, Emily, do you want to start? Well, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't want to be depressing though, but. I guess when it comes to state government, also in Congress, just be prepared for more divided government, more divisiveness. Um, you know, I have a glimmer of hope with, like I mentioned, the $5 billion surplus in Wisconsin, that there are areas, there's room for, for compromise, but I think we uh, could be prepared for a lot of uh, Republicans rejecting Governor Evers' ideas, and we'll see if Governor Evers will outpace his veto record of 146 bills. We'll see. Fair enough, Jesse. Any final thoughts? Um, that's a tough question. Um, be, be more, be more optimistic than me, Jesse. Uh, I'm not good at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, I'm, I, I'm kind of talking in the wrong room here because you're all here. But um, it's it, state government is just incredibly important, and I think we shouldn't forget that. You know the what's going on in Washington is the big shiny object and it's important, it matters, but uh, state government is the thing that affects the way you live your life day to day. Local government's what really affects, you know, your, it's what really affects you immediately. Um, so I think it's important to not get distracted by some of the, um, I don't know, the palace intrigue and pay more attention to who's representing you in Madison. And journalism matters. Journalism matters. <laughs> It, it does. So um, I'll, I'll start off dark, um, which is that we have seen in the last uh, couple of years the, the, the rising toxic divisiveness of our politics, which uh, has been feeding the possibility of political violence, um, which is very, very real. And I'm afraid that it's growing. I think all of the incentives um, are toward that kind of splintering. So everything that is bad that's been happening will likely get worse before it gets better, especially with this presidential election coming up. However, having said that, this election was a rather extraordinary pushback and a reminder that Americans are not willing to just acquiesce to this quietly. When you think about the bullet that we just dodged. Imagine if all those election deniers who won those governor's races, those secretary of state's elections, what that would mean for the next presidential election. Um, so we are by no means out of the woods. There's still talk of you know, breaking the country apart. We've seen the willingness of individuals to engage and to, to, uh, to rationalize political violence. Um, that hasn't gone away. But this election, I think, did underline, the, at least for now, the resilience of, of the American electorate and of the democratic process. That's a very nice uh, way to end uh, with the resilience of the American people. Let's thank our panelists.
now it's dying last second. Uh, and also thank you for, again for coming tonight and for asking insightful questions. Really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you in the future. Have a good night. <laughs>